from there, I guess. It's, Scott's been also been following a female leopard, and she had fortunately has head headed north into Biffle's Hook. But interestingly, she came along the road that we travelled early this morning, and she was on top of our vehicle tracks. And I think that's probably Karula. It's a roundabout where we last saw her tracks. Right, marvellous time here at the dam. Let's uh, go and see what else Juma has to offer us this morning. Assuming I can start Wendy, of course. Come on, brave girl. There we go. A little bit of a lottery. Now to head across to the buff what's it called? Hold on, Buffalo Pan. It's called Buffalo Pan. I want to call it Buffalo's Hook. Made the connection in my head. But it's one of the only other water sources on Arethusa. And can you believe? Just a week ago, we were around Red Dam when we had Karula and Tingana. If you think back to that sighting, if you were watching, remember how much water there was in Red Dam? They went down. They had a drink. There's nothing. There is absolutely no water left in Red Dam. The mud is dry. Just from a couple of really, really hot and windy days, that evaporation effect is phenomenal. I think it might be a bit too windy. Usually the animals love to come around this area because it's nice and open. So, which means they can see far into the distance and they can keep an eye on any predators. I think even the warthogs are hiding this morning. There's a family of them, oops, windy. There's a family of them that utilize this termite mound. It looks like they're also staying in bed, hiding away in their holes. See if this little thing wants to come out. Cool. I'm just gonna see if that head pops out of the hole. There was a little dwarf mongoose that was ran in there and popped itself in there. Let's just wait and give it a moment to see if curiosity takes hold. But we were chatting about the water holes and Kathy watching in Memphis, Tennessee. Kathy, you wanted to know if there's any rain forecast. I believe there is sometime in the next few weeks. We should be getting it soon. I hope we do. That being said, there's a lot of predictions about the fact that we are going to be facing a drought. Hey, little mongoose, you're not going to come and join us. Nope. Going to be shy. I promise you there was an animal there. There was a mongoose in there. I definitely saw it run into that hole. I did, hey Brian. <laughs> I'm not going crazy. In terms of rain, I mean this looks like it feels it feels like it should come through. Nope, no mongoose. Bye then. Obviously feeling a little bit camera shy. I'm cruising around on the boundaries of Mr. Tingana's territory. Tingana is the big dominant male leopard in this area. Lynn, you and me both. I still haven't seen the Anderson male either. I'm dying to see him. Oh, that is chilly. I have heard tales about the Anderson male. He's a big male leopard who's right on the boundary with Tingana and I think they've had one or two confrontations and a little bit of testing each other. It appears at the moment that they've drawn a line in the sand, almost literally in the drainage line around uh, on the western boundary of Arethusa. But I've heard that the Anderson male is absolutely enormous in terms of size. I know a lot of comparisons have been made with him and some of the larger leopards in the Londolosi history. 
just have to hope that one day he makes an appearance. And to be honest, Lynn, that's one of the reasons why I'm cruising around this area, trying to see if I can pick up any tracks or any sign that he's been wandering around. Now, theoretically, oh, well, not theoretically, definitely, about three days ago, Tingana was seen mating with Shadow just, just across there over our boundary. And we did get to see him um, on a termite mound. He'd managed to escape the attentions of Shadow for the moment and he found a nice place to hide away from her. They, they could also well be in this area. Mating leopards in general don't necessarily cover all that much ground. Oh wow, okay. Remember when I said that this had plenty of water, it was the only other water source here? It doesn't have any more water. That is actually quite scary. We were here on, what day is it today? I, th I think it's Thursday, we were here on Sunday. And there was plenty of water. I remember remarking on being surprised at that. And there isn't any more. And that essentially leaves the Arethusa Dam as probably the only water source on Arethusa. That's quite terrifying. That that pan was had plenty of water. It was actually quite deep. And it's gone. Okay. Well that changes the game plan a little bit. have encountered a number of safari vehicles. I wonder if there's something happening around here that I've missed out on. Let's find out quickly and then I will continue on to the conversation of what's happening in this area. How's it? How are you? Fantastic. Good, good. Any updates from this side? Um, yes, um, we've got buffaloes in here. In that side? Yeah, just on the central. Yeah, but there were quite some the lines and they are, I guess, busy tracking. Oh Ooh, that's and exciting then, news. They went north um, around the, the buffalo. So they're moving back to the buffalo. So only the tracks are now. All right. Perfect. Yeah. Shop. That's it. That's it. Yeah, now. That's it from this side. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, guys. Hmm. Some interesting news. So, there's a herd of buffalo moving just in this area over there, which admittedly was where we were going to go next and there are tracks of lions following them so it's a big herd big breeding herd of buffalo and as many of our regular viewers will know the lions love to follow behind breeding herds of buffalo looking always looking for an opportunity to make a kill and on days like today it's perfect weather for it it's nice and cool the sun's just finally broken out of the clouds. But I think let's go and see what's happening with that herd of buffalo and see if those lines are moving around the outskirts of them. I wonder which lines it could be. We know where the Birmingham, well, we know where the Birmingham boys were. Not impossible that they covered a distance of, I suppose, about 10 kilometers, entirely, entirely within their means to have done that last night. But it could also be the Salalas, and that would be amazing to be able to follow up on them and hopefully see reunited once again. While well, we slowly make our way up along this road to see if we can spot any lions or buffalo, we should be able to spot the buffalo fairly easily. And an interesting question from Sharon in Pittsburgh. Sharon, you've heard that there are types of fish that will help remove the ticks from hippos. And you're wondering whether or not that happens at Juma and Arethusa. And yes, there will definitely be fish that will head across or head around, cluster around the hippopotamus and remove bits of dead skin, any kind of, in much the same way that you get fish in the ocean that help to clean sharks and whales. They will hang around. It's probably be the tilapia, I think, be one of the main ones. 
that cluster around them. And it's interesting how delicate that that whole ecosystem is. And I know in parts of Africa they've had a problem with a huge increase in mosquitoes and then obviously malaria since that is mosquitoes are the vector of it. And eventually scientists pinpointed it down to the fact that people had actually killed a lot of the big crocodiles for their skins and for their meat. And as a result, the crocodiles were not eating the catfish. The catfish were then flourishing in large numbers and then eating all of the tilapia. So there were no more tilapia. Tilapia are little tiny fish and they feed on mosquito larvae. It came back in a long loop to be connected to the decline of crocodiles in the water. In the water. Hello, one. The animals are starting to come out. They've run out of snooze options on their alarms. Tiny little male steambook. I love watching them move through the vegetation. They're so delicate. Stopping to have a quick scratch in the nibble. Very sweet. And that little tail and enormous eyes. Never fail to be impressed by the size of the eyes of a steenbok. And I suppose when you're that big it pays to be able to see very, very well in case something is coming to try and eat you. Our steenbok's going to disappear and we have buffalo and lions to follow up on. Let's go and see what we can find up Central Road. Now, as far as I know, there were no buffalo seen on the Arathusa Dam camera last night or yesterday, which means they're coming that way, well, there's a good chance that they're going that way for a drink. So keep your eyes peeled this afternoon, in the hottest time of the day, there's a good chance you're going to see an enormous herd of buffalo coming across. Sorry guys, I got distracted by the Game Drive channel. Now we're going to start heading across towards the buffalo and in the meantime let's see what James is up to on his side. So from tracking the exciting prospect of buffalo herds being chased by lions, we have got you Nyala. A very large herd of Nyala, for, well they certainly were quite a large herd, they've now melted a bit into the bush. A very beautiful antelope in what is now some very stunning light. The sun um, breaking through the clouds, probably not so much breaking through as baking through. I think it's definitely managing to burn away some of those clouds. And in the gorgeous golden light you can see some Nyala, some youngsters and some cows. And the other thing that you can hear as the sun comes out, these birds love the sun, that's the white-browed scrub robin. And you might be able to hear them calling in the background. And what the, it's doing, this white-browed scrub robin, if that is what it is, I'm pretty sure it is, is that it's, it's imitating some other birds. It's doing a rattling cesticola quite badly. And various other birds. There you can hear it going. I say most likely a white-browed scrub robin, but they're not normally very good mimics. And I wonder if it isn't a sabota lark. Now it's doing all sorts of rattling cesticular calls, but it's definitely not a rattling cesticular calling. Very peaceful out here, I must say. Nice breeze. We're not going to complain about that at all, given the heat that we've had over the last little while. And I'm sure you'll find that those Nyala cows, the mature ones, will be just about ready to drop their next load of lambs. 
or calves. Now often it might be a little bit, bit confusing to you if you're not used to this sort of terminology, but we talk about calves and lambs and ewes and cows and bulls and rams. And it's all got to do with the sort of size of the animals, fairly arbitrary size differential. But basically when you get to Nyala size, you have a Nyala bull and a Nyala I've heard them referred to as ewes and cows, but anything smaller than a nyala is going to be a ewe and a ram, and anything larger than a nyala is going to be a bull and a cow, and then it'll be a calf for the youngster, and then a lamb for anything smaller than a nyala. Right, get us press off. I did not come across those elephants that we heard calling from the dam earlier, um, but we are ever hopeful, ever hopeful. It is just amazing, as soon as that sun touches you, you really do feel um, an escalation of temperature that is uh, quite intimidating when you consider what the midday is going to be like out here. Whew. Apparently we are expecting a bit of uh, rain on the weekend, which will be marvellous. So we were sitting at that water hole earlier, this is Nyala city out here. There's another little herd down there and there's an, a lamb or a calf with a bull. And while we're looking at them, Christopher in Arizona, you were asking about water, we were sitting at the dam there and you say, did the landowners of Arethusa and Juma ever dig out holes that collect water. Um, they do. Christopher, that dam there is, a, is an artificial water point. There's a whole wall that's been built up to collect the water. Um, so absolutely, there are three or four just on Juma alone. All the Buffelshook landowners, there are about 74 of them, I think. Uh, no, not quite that many, but all of them have private homes there, and their private homes have all got little dams in front of them. So. Yeah, lots and lots of artificial, well, not artificial so much as a, well, they are artificial really, uh, man-made water holes if you like. There's a beautiful Nyala ball. And most of our water does come from what we call boreholes. And Derek, you're asking about wells. I think you mean the same sort of thing. A borehole is a is a deep hole in the ground out of which water is pumped. And over here we call them boreholes. And I think that's exactly what you mean with wells. And that's where all the water comes from for our, uh, our camps and our lodges. And then some of the water that gets pumped into the pans will come from boreholes. In fact, all of it. If, if they is any pumping of water into the pans, it will come from wells or boreholes. So there's no other kind of main, there's no main water supply here other than from boreholes. Right, that's a little forktailed drongo, you can see, little black bird following gently along with the nyala. Right. So Jamie has found one half of what she said she was going to find you. Um, maybe the other half will come along. A herd of buffalo will head across to those and I'll continue my quest for whatever it is that might be around the corner here. And the half of what I said I would find consists of probably a herd of about 400 buffalo very vocally mooing away all around us. Oh, yes, hello. <laughs> and that, of course, is a sound that will attract every lion's attention in the area. And we never fear, we will be heading across towards those lions when we have a chance. We're just letting some of the other vehicles head across first. The first thing that strikes me is about these buffalo is that some of them are actually looking very thin. I think they're really starting to feel the impact of the drought quite significantly. Quite a few hip bones sticking out, some ribs sticking out. 
And for buffalo that are bulk grazers, if the grass quality declines, life becomes very, very difficult. I'm hoping this female is going to move forward and bring her little calf out with her. Lots of little babies. The lions have been following behind this herd, hoping to find a way to monopolize on the bounty that this is for them. Not sure which lions they are. We're going to have to wait and see and find out when we get there. But a buffalo herd is not quiet. They are all calling. Every baby's at the back. I'm going to try and shift forward a little bit. Just bear with me one moment. Somebody's trying to call me on the radio. Sorry guys, bear with me while I shift forward and just listen to the happenings on the Game Drive channel. Make sure we don't miss our chance to go and see those lions. Uh, station who is calling Jamie, go ahead. Copy that, thank you. Look at that little one, only a couple of months old. And this particular calf is looking very healthy. Nice and round. And imagine the confusion of being a young calf moving around in these huge herds. It's so important for them to know where their mothers are. And a lot of those calls that we hear are between mothers and calves trying to relocate each other in the confusion. Because even though this little one is still grazing, and still feeding, and still dependent on his mother, or her mother, sorry, it is a she, still completely dependent on her mother for milk. And there you go, look at the buffalo supplementing their diet. Oh, that's the, an old looking lady. And that skin infection around her face is quite possibly mange. She's even got a slightly crooked horn. <coughs> And the buffalo, because there's not much grass cover and not much in the way of nutrients from it, they've actually switched and a lot of them are browsing from the trees. That's not unusual to see. We do see them browsing, but for the most part, they are bulk grazers. And far more reliant on grass. They just have to supplement at the moment. Shuffle forward again. Let's see if we can get a nice view of the rest of the herd coming through. This is a huge herd. Because it's so thick in here and because there's so little grass, they're quite spread out, which again makes life much easier for a, a lion looking for a piece of luck. Morning, buffalo. Be careful. There's lions. There's lions about. I'm curious to see who these particular lions are. I'm not sure if you guys have any guesses. I'm trying to work it out. I will tell you that there are definitely females there. Beyond that, I'm not too sure. Let's see if we can guess who it might be. Now send your answers through to hashtag Safari Live on Twitter. Or you can email them through to questions at wildearth.tv and you are as much in the dark as I am at this point. Mm, there's the sun starting to come out. Provide a little bit of warmth on a cool and cloudy day. Interestingly, because it's been so cool and cloudy, I actually haven't seen that many ox pickers flying around. They're around, you might hear the zipping sound that they make. But for the most part, they're 
free of ox peppers. I think it's, I think the cool and cloudy weather actually contributed to the fact that they're not around. It's windy, it's cloudy, they've taken a little bit longer to get airborne and to come and find a source of prey. In this case, the ticks all over the buffalo herd. Yes, I said it was an enormous herd. Barbara, I did say 400. That is a guess beyond guesses, if I'm completely honest. I know this is a huge herd. I can hear them all around us. And I'm just trying to play with numbers a little bit. It could be more. I don't think it's less. Have a look and watch the Arethusa Dam camera if they do, or if we get a chance to see them out in the open, then we will be able to double check and see exactly, well no not exactly, unless you have the patience to count 400 buffalo. But we'll definitely be able to get a better idea of numbers when they do move out into the open. Hello little boy. Very very young sub-adult male. It's not just the lions that favor buffalo as a potential meal. Mo, in answer to your question, yes, people in this area will eat buffalo. Not within the Sabi sands, obviously, because all of the animals out here are protected. It would be poaching to go and feed on them. But yes, people do eat buffalo. They also wouldn't want to be taking buffalo meat from around the Kruger because of the incredible contagiousness is that a word is contagiousness a word i'm not sure hold on either way the buffalo within kruger are all carriers of tuberculosis and quite often foot and mouth disease as well so buffalo that are utilized as a food source are very carefully controlled and they will be taken from disease-free stock but for the most part, Mo, I wouldn't say that it's a popular food source. And the reason why is that disease-free buffalo, so buffalo that are available as an option as a food source, they tend to be worth an incredible amount of money. Because of the amount of time and effort that's gone into breeding and creating a stock that is free from disease, and there's a long story behind it, but essentially one of the only disease-free populations came from the Eastern Cape a couple of decades ago and they've been slowly, slowly bred up into a viable population. And at the same time, what there is a program to make sure that there's a bit of genetic diversity, they make sure that they get a couple of disease-free calves from other areas and breed them up. The end result is that in certain circles, buffalo are almost invested in, disease-free buffalo are almost invested in like, um, they're, they're essentially almost farmed. And when I say they're worth a lot of money, a disease-free female, a young female, maybe not even a breeding age yet, is probably somewhere in the region of half a million rand. I'm not even sure what that is in our exchange rate anymore. And I know that a couple of breeding bulls have sold for an enormous amount. All right, buffs, don't stress. I mentioned that that female we were seeing is quite an old female. Yes, hello. And Dee, you were wondering what a lifespan is of a buffalo. You're looking at somewhere in the region for the old males of around 15 years. You might get the exceptional cases of a little bit older, but for the most part, I would say the average is between 10 and 15 years. That's in the wild, of course. You as always, you'll get animals that live slightly longer in captivity. And 
This is actually the tail end of the herd, which means I'm going to have to do some shuffling around and repositioning. But in the meantime, it sounds as though James has found an interesting bug to draw your attention to. Let's head, head across and have a look at that. I will be back with you with the buffalo in just a few moments. So from the astonishment of a buffalo herd down to the slightly ridiculous sight of a grub or caterpillar that is living in a tambuti seed. Now, earlier on in the year, you may have seen Brent and I showed a couple of times these tambuti seeds with jumping, they look like jumping beans and they leap around because of the presence of this moth caterpillar inside and it's called Emporia melanobasis as far as I can remember and this fat little grub has eaten out the insides of this tambuti seed and I think will probably pupate very soon and then become a small moth after that pupation process has taken place but a really nice sort of custard colored little caterpillar I'll try and pull him out completely Come on, get out. There we go. So you can see he's actually attached by a bit of silk. So probably about to pupate. Isn't that lovely? And it's that caterpillar doing sort of flick flax inside the seed that makes them jump. And it's of the Tambuti tree. And the Tambuti tree, of course, is highly toxic to human beings and many other animals. And so we won't be having a bite of this grub. And I suspect that they are... And they probably imbibe quite a lot of the toxins in the tambuti and that probably helps them rather like a lot of the uh, milkweed eating moths and caterpillars uh, probably as adults are quite toxic to predators right stunning little picture of this grub okay so i think um now that you've had a look at this tiny little <laughs> worm we'll take you back to the slightly more impressive herd of 400 buffalo with Jamie and we'll see what other uh, little wonders we can find along this road slowly tucking itself away into the bush hold on one moment we'll get you a nice view of them I don't want to scare this lot. They've got that look about them like they might go sprinting away from me. Hello guys. Yes, sorry. That big girl. Lots of heads watching me. And I think that you'll probably find that these buffalo have spent quite a hard night. The lions have probably been there. The lions have probably been pursuing them all evening. It would have been windy last night. It would have been pitch black because of the clouds, which is ideal hunting conditions for lions. And many of our regular viewers have accompanied us on hunting efforts at night with lions and herds of buffalo. And it's a very dramatic experience. The lions push forward, the buffalo push back. And it's incredibly stressful for the buffalo herd concerned and the lions of course who are looking for a meal that doesn't involve kicking and being caught by their horns and buffalo are not defenseless by any means they come equipped with some serious weaponry and serious bulk we are approaching the tail end of this herd but i'm going to shift forward and, there goes the run shift forward one more time so we can get a clear view I don't understand flies. There's a whole herd of buffalo to go and sit on and they all want to cluster around my nose. I, I don't understand. Shifting around through, just trying to find a nice open gap for us. Hello, big girl. Nice mature buffalo cow watching us down the top of her nose and making it very clear exactly what she thinks about us. Wow. 
just thinking about some of the numbers of the costs of disease-free buffalo, you're looking at a, an average from 2013, having had that chat with you about how much money they're worth. 2013, the average was somewhere in the region of about 870,000 Rand. That's huge. The record for the most impressive male was 40 million Rand. 40 million Rand for one animal who was then used as a stud bull. And then for a female and a calf, was 19.5 million. Now that's of course all in rands. Please excuse me if I can't quite convert. I, I don't even want to know what the exchange rate is at the moment. Either way, it is a phenomenal amount of money. And thank you, Edward, for doing a little bit in the way of conversions. So half a million rand converts to about $35,000 at the moment. Still enormous. Sorry guys, bear with me one moment. I just want to, I think we've finally got our spot at the Lions. I just want to double check. Copy that, thank you. What is the exact lock of those in Gala? Copy that, thank you. I'll make my way in now. Okie dokie. Well, let's go and figure out where this lion is hiding. It seems as though she's just a little bit further that way. Let's see if we can figure it out. And then we'll find out who these lions really are. I'm going to make my way across towards this elephant sighting. Elephant? Where did that come from? Lion sighting. And I've spotted someone who can give me directions. So let's do a quick pop across to James, see what he's found, and I will be back with you very shortly. Right, just before you go to the really exciting part of the day, look at this special little fellow. Um, well, I can't find him in the book, so I'm going to dub him the boxing mantid. Look at him, he's a praying mantis. Watch how he follows my finger around, and now if I can try and make him, he was trying to sort of punch me earlier. There we go. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? fellow and he's only got one feeler left his other one's been bitten off or fallen off so they the praying mantises for those of you who don't know are a predatory group of insects and they will find other things to other insects to eat and on the inner side of this little boxing gloves that he's got here um, are spines that they will use to catch their prey with very spiky things and on a big praying mantis you can actually they can draw blood if they want to uh, but this little chap is not a particular threat to human beings but you can see as he extends forward there you might be able to see the kind of hooks on the front of the boxing gloves and that's what he uses to catch his prey. No toxins and they normally just sort of bite and then suck out the insides. Isn't that spectacular? <laughs> I wish I knew a bit more about them. Um, they will lay eggs of course as will all and they they can fly this one I don't know why this one hasn't flown away yet but they can certainly fly now he's just punching forward in a sort of threat display um, and then they make a very distinctive egg sac called an uthika and that egg sac is a sort of silken quite hard but silky 
casing that they hang in trees and very distinctive and easy to find. And unlike many of the insects, they don't make uh, larva. So when they're born, they sort of resemble the adults and then they molt. Look at that. Can you see that, Chandra? Cleaning the feeler. Running the feeler all the way through the jaws to clean it. So even the insects are concerned about how they look. In fact, your common garden variety cockroach will do the same thing. Oh, and there's the... Oh, just a question from Jennifer in Toronto uh, that I'm not sure if I've heard correctly. Um, I'm just going to ask, before, before I make a horrible mistake, I'm going to get the question again for you from, from Jennifer. Ah. ah, do caterpillars have sex? Thank you, Jennifer, for uh, that question. Uh, caterpillars don't, in fact, have sex. And that is because caterpillars are the larval stage of moths and butterflies, so they can't breed. Only the adults have sex and they then will lay eggs. And so you, I'm sure you've seen butterflies attached at the bottom. They attach themselves at the bottom like that and they transfer, um, sp the male will transfer sperm to the female and she will then lay eggs which will hatch to become caterpillars which will not have sex until they are adults. Um, and talking of that kind of thing, uh, praying mantises of course are well known after they have had sex for the females eating the males. So once he has um, lying in bliss after the uh, conjugal affair, so the female will then eat the male, which um, is not a particularly attractive trait of a female praying mantis. He's still punching something. Look at that, isn't that amazing? Marilyn in California, I sympathize with you. You say that you like this new friend of mine and he's making you quite like bugs. Well, I quite agree. When I got to the bush, I didn't want anything to do with these creepy things. But now I find them absolutely fascinating, especially the boxing variety of <laughs> praying mantis. <laughs> And I might actually, I'm not much of a fighter myself, but in terms of a boxing match, I think I could probably beat this mantis, uh, mainly with a, just a, you know, I don't think we'll do that to him then. So they are, I, I, the insects are absolutely astonishing because, well, you see he's heated up now. You see that, John, he's been sitting in the sun now for a while. And now he's becoming a lot more active, a lot more able to move with speed. I'm just going to move him back towards the middle. There we go. Um, still punching wildly at anything that threatens him. Um, the insects are an amazing group. They're the most numerous group of animals in the world. There are lots and lots of different orders of insects, and that's, I mean, I don't know how clued up you are on taxonomy, but for example, there will be thousands of mantis species in the world. And so a field guide, for example, like the one I've got, the chances of finding this exact species uh, is almost negligible, but you can probably get it down to kind of a generic level. It's probably what we call a bark mantid, if I'm not horribly mistaken, but there will be lots and lots of different kinds of bark mantids. And every so often, you can see he cleans off his feelers. You might even be able to see his... Well, I'm not sure that he has a tongue, but <laughs> cleaning the face now. Right, now, if you watch there carefully how he cleaned his face, in much the same way as a cat would. I think rather than this uh, boxing mantis cleaning its face, let's go along and look at some real cats, real predators with Jamie. See you later.
and we have arrived with two mystery females and their buffalo kill or what's left of their buffalo calf kill obviously it was a difficult night or a difficult morning for the buffalo herd and at the moment it is incredibly hotly debated amongst the guides on the radio as to who these lions actually are and where they've come from there's two options floating around at the moment one is Styx females the other is two females from the Salala breakaway group I believe in that case there would be lionesses that we've never seen before here's the other one hiding behind the bush we will reposition in a moment so that you can have a look at her as well shifted around Two of them must have been very hungry. They've finished off most of that. And she's dragging it into a safer spot underneath the weeping wattle. What do you think, guys? I defer to your judgment. Take lots of screenshots and let's see if we can figure out who she is. Of course, we're looking for those characteristic whisker spot patterns, different on every single lion. The back of her neck to me looks very scruffy. Almost like she's been mating with a male. I'm sure I see bite marks and scuff marks around there. Could be from a hunt, but it looks more to me like teeth marks. She's making sure she gets the most out of that, what's left of that little buffalo. I wonder who it could be. If it is the Salala breakaways, then they've spent time with the Matimba males in the past. I hear that they have been mating with them over the last few weeks, so that could be where those bite marks come from. If it is a Styx female, it could be one of the Styx females that was mating with one of the Birminghams. A mystery that we need to solve. This, what's left of this buffalo tells me I can see a little bit of a horn sticking out that tells me it was a very young or fairly young calf and D you were wondering if the older animals or the younger animals are the ones that make for easy prey for lions or leopards it's unlikely a leopard's going to tackle or take on a buffalo herd but in terms of easy prey, they're more like the lions are more likely to go for either calves or the older buffalo. I would say in terms of numbers, statistically, you'll probably find that calves are the ones that are most hit. But again, that depends on the pride. So even an old buffalo that's fully grown can put up a serious fight against lions. So for two lionesses on their own, it makes more sense for them to target a calf and dodge the defensive actions of the mother rather than try to take down a full-grown buffalo. If they had males present with them when they were hunting, then they tend to go for the larger, and yes, it, will, it may be the older animals because they'll be slightly slower, possibly even moving at the back of the group. And I wondered why there was a smell wafting over me. I've just realized I parked next to the first result of her big meal <laughs> you spotted from there Brian things you want to avoid in a lion sighting th that that is what quite often happens when the lion eats the rich organs so the livers and the kidneys um, yes definitely avoid at all costs do not drive over Somehow somebody's had a very lucky escape because that tire track goes right along the edge. Definitely to be dodged. Please, please let me not drive through that on my way out. I've got to remember. Yeah, yeah, I think Brian will <laughs> Brian would be terribly upset with me if I did that. Don't worry, Brian. Just um just you know, give me a casual reminder if the wheel starts to stray. 
you know, crunching away on some of the smaller rib bones. I think that's what she's got there. She's got a rib. The lions don't have the same crushing power that hyenas do, but they will gnaw away at the smaller bones and quite often take away the edge pieces of it to get good access at whatever calcium and nutrients they can get out of it. I don't think I've ever seen this lioness before, but I could be wrong. Let's see how old she might be. To me, she looks like a fairly old lioness. The other one looked quite young. I'm going to shift around and have a look when we have an opportunity to see who the, the younger one might be as well. How amazing is this? We could be looking at lions that we've never seen before, or at least I've never seen before. I'm sure for regular viewers, they, these two have popped onto the screen once or twice. And we're very close to the southern boundary of Arethusa, or fairly close to the southern boundary of Arethusa. It's entirely plausible. This is the area that the Salalas first moved through when they started pushing back up into this area. And it could be that these two females have done a very similar thing. I did hear an update from some of the guides in the area that the females of the Salala breakaway group were seen looking very thin near the Matimba males and it appeared as, as though the Matimba males had been essentially hogging all access to prey. That generally happens with male lions. They get the lion's share, that's where the expression comes from. They will, they're a hundred kilograms bigger than the female. So they can throw their weight around very effectively and push them off the kill and get the most of the, most access to the meat and the best parts of it, which might explain why these lionesses have actually moved up into Arethusa, if it is them, to have a chance. They've probably followed the buffalo herd up here. It gives them a chance to enjoy the spoils without being interrupted by one of the Matimba males. Interesting that we've got some differing opinions as to who this might be. And there's a suggestion from Power Funk Radio that this lioness looks like a Styx female. There's also somebody who suggested that it is the amber-eyed female from the Inkuhuma Pride. Teresa, I'm honestly not sure. She does have very amber eyes. That being said, one of the Styx females also has very amber eyes. It could be either of those. I can hear a squirrel shouting away. I think probably in response to a bird of prey. She's enjoying whatever mouthful she got there. How's it? How are you? Yeah, good, good, thanks. Any idea which lioness is? Salalas. Yeah, the Salala breakaways? Mm, not Salalas. The Salalas? Mm. Shop, thank you. Yeah. No, they were with the Birmingham boys. We seem to have an answer to our question as to who these two lionesses are. And the prevailing opinion at the moment is that they are the Salalas. So two of the Salala females that I certainly have never seen before. Which makes the explanation that they've pushed up away from the Matimbas entirely plausible. I'm going to, once she's had a couple more mouthfuls, I'm going to shift around so that we can see the younger lioness. big lioness. She's got quite a broad and large face and big jaw. 
is actually, now that I think about it, but I mean this is supposition, it's almost reminiscent of the genetic line of the Salalas. The tail lioness, tailless lioness. There's something similar, but it might be my imagination. Oh, there's a hyena moving on the outside, quite far on the outside. I'm not sure if Brian's going to be able to get a view. Hyena moving around the outskirts waiting, I think, for an opportunity for when these lionesses leave their kill. Sorry, Brian, I can't see it anymore. It's somewhere just cruising around the outskirts waiting for its chance to come and join us. Now two lionesses are more than a match for one hyena. They would not be able to push, a hyena would not be able to push these two off. But if it were to recruit more individuals from the clan to come and help, then there's a good chance that they could chase the two lionesses away. And that's where having a male around or a male lion around can be incredibly useful as a defense mechanism. Now wait and see if that hyena pops back into view. You never know might be hungry, it might decide that it's worth the risk. I think let's shift around and change our view and maybe we can have a look at the younger female who's with this lioness. backed out of my position and Lenny you were a little bit confused as to what I was pointing out as the smelly thing behind or next to my wheel. Hello girl, it's alright. It's okay. Bless you. Stop here because we've got a, it's not the clearest view. I just wanted to settle down a little bit and get used to the idea of us being around her. She did sit up. She's not. She's actually not that young. Sorry, Lenny. Um, in answer to your question, what was so smelly? When lions first feed on a kill, they feed on the most, the richest parts of the organs, the ones that are very rich in iron. What that typically does is that gives them diarrhea almost straight away, and that was the result. It was poo, or. I even hesitate to call it lion scat. Oh, I think that other vehicle is on its way to meeting it. Oh well, I'm going to have some smelly tires. But if you drive through lion scat or lion poo, you're going to be smelling it for a long time. And I'm not talking just maybe a couple of minutes after you've left. I'm talking the rest of the week. And nobody's going to want to drive your vehicle. Nobody's going to thank you for it. Generally, just in terms of things you don't want to do, it's quite high on the list. It also scares away animals, other animals in the area. Uh, very much worth paying attention to what, what's known in the industry as landmines. And usually you find them around a buffalo kill or a, a lion kill. They tend to deposit the end results of their digestive process all around. And it's so easy to forget, it's something that new guides do a lot. And I say new guides, I did it the other day, so I can't really judge. But you're so busy looking at what's happening with the lions, trying to figure the whole sighting out and figure out your best route, that you forget to check where you're driving. Hugely, hugely unpleasant smell. I don't think I need to describe it, I'm pretty sure I can leave it to your imagination. Let me know if you want any further descriptions. But I'm pretty sure you get the idea. And lions just in general actually are not the most pleasant smelling of creatures. They're not the sort of, they don't carry with them the sort of scent that makes you want to go and cuddle them. That combination of rotting meat smell that hangs perpetually around them. And they're also heavily parasite ridden. And you don't want to go and put your hand anywhere near a, well, I suppose that goes without saying you don't want to go and put your bare hand anywhere near a wild lion's mouth. That's pretty obvious, but not just for the risk of having your arm bitten, but also because they carry such high parasite loads. Doesn't bother them though. 
Animals are so much more resilient than we will ever be. They're capable of eating carcasses that have been sitting out in the sun for days. <laughs> the female at the back has acquired a, what would you call it? It's not a dressing, but a something garnish. of a garnish. Thank you, Brian. A garnish of weeping wattle to add to her meal of buffalo. That's exactly the word I was looking for. There you go. Some of us might put um, a little bit of rocket or something on our meal. She's <laughs> garnished hers with weeping wattle. I'm not sure what that adds to the taste. But obviously doesn't seem to bother her. Now, the, as I said, the general consensus appears to be that this is the two Solala females. And Joan, you, or Joanne, sorry, you were wondering if this is a different group to the, to the two females and the three sub-adult males that we've seen in the past. And the answer is yes. The Solala pride has actually been, in all of the chaos, it has been split up to an extent. So the female without the tail, she fled bringing the young female and the three sub-adult males with her. They fled away from the Matimba males because of the danger that the Matimba males pose to her sub-adult male cubs. And these two stayed behind. They didn't have quite the same threat level. They are both adult females. They were both then would have instantly come into false estrus to placate the Matimba males and then have mated with them. They won't be pregnant just yet because in any kind of pride takeover situation the lioness's body responds as I said by going into a, a false estrus and that's a way of making sure that they don't invest time and energy in producing males offspring and then the males just get kicked out because they haven't been firmly established enough yet. It's quite a complicated system. It is very common for lion prides to split during a takeover, which is essentially what happened. In this case, it was a takeover by the Matimba males. And they split away. It's usually the adults with sub-adults or cubs of a younger age that are still at huge risk of infanticide by the incoming males. But instead of following the other two, the other two females, they stuck around with the Matimba males. Although they've made a quick break in order to enjoy some breakfast on their own. I'm inclined to believe the word of one of the Elephant Plains trackers in his identification of these two as the Salalas because they will have seen them in the past. But Eddie Abbey, you were wondering if it's the lioness that the Birmingham boys were seen mating with? And the answer I think is no. And in fact I'm fairly certain it's no. The Styx lioness that's on Torchwood with them at the moment is definite, almost certainly identified as a Styx lioness. The lioness who was with them a couple of days before that has never been identified. So that is a possibility, but unlikely. Now lionesses are clever. And that's why I say that it's a possibility, because in her area where she's from, the Matimba males are currently in control but they can't be with the females all the time. And there's a chance that if the Birmingham boys came across the boundary, she might have mated with them in an attempt to placate them and to trick them into believing that any babies that they bear are belong to the Birmingham boys or the Matimbas. It's that same technique that we see leopards do. And there's been interesting research carried out. We always think that the pride males that are in control of an area, we always automatically assume them to be the father, but apparently in maybe up to 40% of the cases, the cubs are actually not theirs. They're just tricked into thinking that they are. And that's because the lionesses employ the same technique that female leopards do, and that's to mate with a couple of males in the area. And that means that if their dominant pride members are away, 
or oh, sorry, their dominant coalition members are away marking territory and patrolling elsewhere, and a strange male comes along, they've reduced the risk that he might have towards their cubs. It was a slightly convoluted explanation, but I hope you got that from what I was trying to say. Let's try and change our view again, now that that lioness has calmed down. It's resting tucked away in what is essentially a small quarry bush. Doesn't look like it's providing much shade. Well, Blair, it seems as though you agree with me as well that these are the two females from the Salala, what are thought of as the Salala breakaways or the Mangeni pride, or possibly the Styx pride. I don't think they're Styx females. Most of the Styx are around Chitwa and Torchwood, which is quite far east of here. I would have been surprised if they'd covered that distance in essentially a day. I think it's the two females. There's a bit of confusion between or amongst the guides as to this, the Salalas versus the Salala breakaways, and I'm still trying to get a little bit of clarification on that. But I agree with you, Blair. I think, I think they're Salala breakaways. <laughs> she seemed to shake her head violently in response to that. Maybe she's trying to tell us something. Let's do another circuit. See if we can get a slightly different view. Just switch it up a little bit, especially now that the sun is starting to come out and blaze down on them. got a viewer watching from northwest England and Diana I think you're quite fortunate in only being two hours behind us I just had a chat long chat with my brother who lives in Scotland at the moment about the time differences because for some reason I always forget exactly where he is in time and space um, and so I end up texting him very early in the morning. Well, Diana, you wanted to know, you said that since the drama with the takeover, you haven't seen any new cubs. And Diana, I don't think that the, first of all, I don't think that that third sticks cub has survived. It hasn't been seen in weeks. And most of the guides seem to think that the Birmingham boys did get it in the end. When we, in terms of when we can expect new cubs, there was a chance because the sticks. Oh, mm -hmm. they, oh no! Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, Diana. I'm go, I'll get back to you in one moment. I think I've done a terrible thing. You've done an unspeakable thing. Have I done an unspeakable <laughs> thing? Oh, Brian, I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so so sorry. Um, yes, I, I drove through some of the lion diarrhea. That's highly unpleasant. I'm probably not going to be welcome back at camp now. No. Nah. No. Sorry, Brian. Brian might have. <laughs> my, Brian might decide to walk home. Um, <laughs> oh no, Diane. Um, in terms of when we can expect new cubs, the sticks female. The one thing that throws doubt into my mind is that one of the sticks females was mating with the Matimba male right before that takeover happened. Almost to the day of that beginning of the takeover experience and she could possibly be pregnant and what she'll do in that case is her body would have gone into false estrus she would have mated with the Birmingham boys whilst she was still pregnant as a way of tricking them into thinking that they're the father of those cubs that could come from the Matimba males that would 
that would have happened in around the middle of August, it's now middle of September, middle of October, we would start to have the potential that she's going to have cubs in the next few weeks if that mating was successful and if she got pregnant from it. So in the next few weeks a Styx female could have cubs which she would then hide away for another few weeks away from us. You know how lions tuck themselves away in a den. <laughs> Shame. The flies are driving this poor lioness insane. It's okay though because she's found a really comfortable way to lie against, pillow her head against a guari bush. For the rest of the females to finish off with the question, um, they will go into false estrus almost as soon as the pride takeover is complete. So they'll have been mating with the Birmingham boys, the Inkuhumas have been mating with them, the sticks have been mating with them. Those most likely will not result in pregnancies because as I said, female lionesses have evolved a way of not investing the time and energy of producing a litter of cubs before they're certain that the new males are secure in their position. So it'll be another few months before any of the other females bear any cubs. Bless you, lion. Barbara, in order to answer your question, let me just say that having now coated my tire liberally in one of the foulest substances that we have out here, we, there's a good chance that we may not see any animals. So on this afternoon's drive, you'll be spending most of it on the back of Wendy as a jigger drives around and all of the animals flee within a 500 meter radius. And I certainly wouldn't blame them if they did. I'm exaggerating slightly, but Barbara, yes, the animals do respond to the smell of lion scat on a tire and they'd respond with a fear response or a stress response and we'll try and move away from it. What you'll find is they'll probably stick their heads up and start looking around them to try and figure out where the lion is. Bear in mind that lions carry a very strong scent and for the most part the herbivores of this area are used to encountering it. But with it, if it suddenly arrives in the form of a tire, it tends to disturb them because it makes them wonder where the lion is hiding. What I plan to do, if you're wondering about the various techniques of lion scat removal process, I'm going to go and find a deep drainage line and I'm going to drive through it. And hopefully the sand sticking to the particles of scat will help to dislodge. Unfortunately, there's no rivers to drive through, otherwise I'd drive backwards and forwards a couple of times. Eddie Abbey, the next option, of course, if the drainage line system fails, is bleach. It does work, but you'd be surprised at how very thorough you have to be. Because if you don't get all of the bits of line scat that you've placed in the tread of your tires, you're still going to have that smell accompanying you. So yes, bleach is the next option. Um, the next option after that is possibly abandoning the car somewhere in a drainage line and leaving it for a couple of months. Just burn it. Burn it. Burn Brian says burn it. Burn Brian says it's the end. Burn the tires. <laughs> we are, we've, <laughs> there is no other option. <laughs> the kill around. She's slightly bigger than the other lioness and she's trying to find a nice comfortable position. Um, apparently there wasn't enough garnish on it before. Pat, you're watching all the way in Washington and you're trying to figure out exactly how this whole Salala issue is working. So we've got the adult female that we've seen regularly without the tail accompanied by a female that is very young, right on the cusp of being an adult. So let's call her the sub-adult female. Neither of these two are sub-adults, they're both adult females. And as far as I know, that essentially completes the female makeup of the Salala Pride at the moment. Unless there is one, no, that should be about right. And then there's the three young males who are accompanying their mother 
around the area. I'm going to try and shift backwards so that we can at least get a view now that she's stuck her head quite thoroughly in the weeping waffle. Let's try and see her. I'm just going to liberally recoat my tire. I'm desperately trying to figure out the reason behind namings. Janet, you wanted to know why the ones left behind would be called the breakaways. I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, please give me a little bit of time to try and figure it out. I'm going to have to tie some guides down and get some answers from them. I think they are called the Salala breakaways because of a previous breakaway. So they broke away from the Salala pride before this. Quite possibly in their own way to defend their cubs. That being said, I need to fully clarify that. When I spoke to one of the trackers now, he said that they were not the Salala breakaways, they were just the Salalas. And I'm not sure where that leaves the Salala breakaways. Because then I'm not sure who the Salala breakaways are and what their dynamic is. As far as I always understood, the Salala breakaways were two females, two adult females on their own which most likely is these two. Janet, I'm sorry, I can't give you a better answer. Using her paw to really get in there. And we're getting a bit more clarification. Thank you, Blair. Okay. There we go. We've got we've got some sense as clarified by Blair. <laughs> okay, let's try this again. The Salala breakaways are a pride of 13 from a previous breakaway during a previous takeover, probably in my opinion during the Majingi's time or the Majingi takeover, the Majingilani male coalition. These two are the Salalas from the main pride as are the others that we've seen with the sub-adult males but they've moved away to try and escape the Matimbas leaving only these two members as the more permanently based members of the Salala Pride. Thank you Blair for clearing that up. I've been in a state of constant confusion. You have quite happily solved that problem for me. And as a further addition to confusion, just to make things a little, just to add that little stir to the naming pot, the Salala Breakaways are also now known as the Mangeni Pride. The Birmingham Boys are now known as the Gauri Males from different guides in different areas since they came from the Gauri area. And <laughs> all in all, I, I am going to try and get to terms with the Salalas. But, that being said, I'm so excited to see new females. Oh, there's going to be some growling. I can hear some growling. A very gentle warning to stay away from the kill. In the entire time that we've been here, this female has dominated the buffalo kill. Although they've both had equal access to, fo to food. They both look as though they've swallowed beach balls overnight. But she, the female with the carcass has been very protective over it. When we first arrived, she picked it up and dragged it away from the other female. A little baby buffalo is not a meal to be scoffed at for two lionesses. Although it is a once-off thing, they are going to leave this probably later today. It is a good couple of kilograms of meat in it. It's kept them well fed, given them some very full bellies. And it must be a huge relief for them to not have to share it with those Matimba males. Because one Matimba male could finish off a buffalo calf by himself 
at least these two lionesses were able to share and get a good meal out of it using that rough tongue of hers incredibly spiny and that's another weapon in her armory Hmm. Interesting observation. If we could just get her to smile at us, you might be able to answer Brenda's question. Brenda, you were wondering if she's got a missing left fang. I hadn't noticed, but I must admit I was just... Yes, you're right. Well done, Brenda. That was very impressive. She's not missing it, it's broken. So there's a bit of a stump where it was. But there is definitely not a full lion canine tooth. There we go. I just see that stump sticking out there. That was very, very well observed, Brenda. Well, there you go. We will never ever mistake this lioness again. It's actually not that common to see lionesses, unless they're very old, with broken or missing canines. We'll take note of that as an identifying feature. Oh, Brian, I'm so, so sorry. <laughs> the smell is just wafting. <laughs> well, We've been spending time with a new set of lionesses for me. I believe that James is headed back to explore his Senegal lapwing nest that he found yesterday afternoon. So let's have a look and see if there's any action on the egg side and I will be back with you very shortly. Eggs, eggs for breakfast. Not these ones though. These ones are the eggs of the little Senegal lapwing and we came past here. We knew where the nest was. It wasn't an incredible spotting uh, feat on my part. We knew they were here and the lapwings are not around. They're out foraging obviously. In fact there is one there, Jandre. If we just go up a little bit away, watching us very carefully, there is the mother bird there. So four little eggs that the lapwing, Senegal lapwing, there she is, has laid and is looking after very carefully. So we didn't, certainly wouldn't get out of the car to go and point them out or anything like that. That would stress her out horribly. She doesn't know what the camera's looking at. Then, on the side of uh, birds and their youngsters, the, being the breeding season, Scott very cleverly the other day managed to get a picture of a lilac-breasted roller's nest and we, we went back and did the same thing and we filmed it with this telephone which I've now managed to ruin. There we go, here we go. Okay, now what we're going to do is show you, or try to show you, the image of... How's that genre? Can you see anything there? Yeah. Okay, now it's about 18 seconds long and you can there, you can see it's grown already since Scott did this and the bird is kind of, it's starting to get slightly lilac feathers on its wings and there it moves. There you can see that. Isn't that sweet? So we'll keep doing that every so often. We'll keep doing that and just checking to see how those birds are doing. Thank you, Jeffrey in Texas. Apparently, you had a look at that boxing mantis and you said you thought it might be a bark mantis. I would agree. I think it's probably one of the bark mantises. Um, lots of different kinds of them, of course, but perhaps one of the bark mantises. Right. On we go. Okay, so we're going to head off towards our breakfast. So we're not going to tarry too long with you. Thank you very much for your questions and comments today. Thank you, jean for your efforts on drive, rather than doing this driving. Now, for your last few minutes of drive, we'll send you back to uh, Jamie, who is um, sitting with Tebs and the Lions. And we'll see you this afternoon. Bye-bye, and thanks a lot. Well, when I started this morning's sunrise safari, I certainly didn't expect to get lucky enough to see two lionesses that I've never seen before. 
for some reason that's always an exciting experience and so far weirdly I feel like most of my experiences with new lion prides have been with Brian and there you go Brian we're continuing on with our pattern I'm apologizing again for exposing both of us to the scent of lion scat thank you to all of you for your suggestions as to removal of it I will try possibly end up trying most of them we'll see how we go and failing that burning the tire and buying a new one Brian's <laughs> nodding in agreement I think that he feels that is possibly the only viable solution to the scent of lion's cat attached to your tire I'm not exaggerating it's terrible it's so smelly <laughs> Um, now Clay, you might have missed the update from this morning, right? We've got the two Salalas from the main pride. There's also, of course, that female without the tail and the three young sub-adult males. Clay, I have some wonderful news and I'm so glad that I was wrong about this. It appears as though that sub-adult male is alive. He hasn't been seen now in two days, but it's really, really crucial that he reunites with the rest of that group as quickly as possible. He is just too young to be out and about on his own but still I'm thrilled to say that I was wrong I really thought the Birmingham boys had killed him and I'm happy to hear that he escaped them he's obviously more resilient than I myself gave him credit for very impressed with him especially given the injury that he had although it seems to be healing up very nicely so wonderful news and a company with these two lionesses and fantastic prospects for our afternoon drive there's a good chance these guys are going to head across to Arethusa Dam so keep your eyes peeled after a meal of buffalo there's nothing better than a slightly weedy drink well everybody thank you so much for joining us on a sunrise safari I hope you've enjoyed this as much as I have and of course a big thank you and welcome back again to Brian it's great to have you on board with us as well as to James, Jandre and Tebs who are on the back of Wendy big thanks to Nikki and Tara who've been filling us in on the whole lion situation and of course passing across your brilliant questions well, wherever you are in the world, have a fantastic day or a fantastic evening, and we will catch you for the Sunset Safari. Bye-bye for now.